sure you're listening to IELTS FM on 103. This is Ennis Morrison. And my featured artist tonight is Julian Cope, up here at the moment, seemingly uh, filming stone circles and stuff like that. If you just come and see what's going on in Britain, in this big island, it's kind of empowering to realize that it's on your doorstep. But we don't have to drive across America to uh, achieve our inner self. I came out of punk, and punk was taught to sort of diss everything um, to do with hippies, and Stonehenge was to do with hippies. So I was one of those who came to mock and remain to pray. You know, I went to Stonehenge this one day with my mother-in-law, and she said, darling, when was this done? And I told her the date. I said it was about 2,000 years before Christ. Wow, that's just amazing. It's physically so impressive. And I thought, wow, and I suddenly saw it through her eyes. And I was suddenly impressed by it. And we came to Avebury and flipped out that there was this stuff, these kind of, you know, pre-roofed temples lying around on the landscape of Britain. And so my mind started thinking, wow, we've really been brought up to diss where, we're, where we are. If you spend your whole life thinking, oh, I can't wait to get away to Ibiza, then you're not going to look close by. Everything I do is from a rock and roll angle. And I want to explain through my actions that rock and roll didn't start off as an excuse for sloth. It started off because people were forward thinking mofos. And I want to turn it around for that very reason. Yeah, I rock. So I took eight years to research and write my book on these first temples. I visited over 500 sites because it's essential to see what the ancients were seeing. I also wanted to let people know what's out there. So now we're going to compress all that research into two weeks on the road. The whole point of Land's End is that it was never Romanized. It belongs to the part of Britain that I term beyond Rome. We are taught to believe that the Romans came and cured us. Cured us of our barbarian ways. I think that lifting that lid is the hardest thing. But once you've lifted that lid, then all this information starts scurrying out. And in terms of the mythology of, uh, of Britain, it's, um, it's something that can then enrich our lives. We're at Tune Coit. And Tune Coit is a dolmen, the smallest dolmen, but the most beautiful of all. A dolmen is a kind of uh, a megalithic or great stone box with a large capstone on top. Um, dates back about mm, four and a half, five thousand years. Um, and it's a phenomenon that you find all over Cornwall, you find all over. West Wales, parts of South Wales, and a lot in Ireland. But elsewhere, you don't really see them. You see some in Brittany, but um, this is where you find the best ones. People love to think of Tune Coit as being the megalithic mushroom, and I think really uh, it's the one that looks most like it. It's, um, it's so much smaller than the others. It's really hard. You can squeeze in here, but even that's difficult. First thing that this says to me is free time. You don't spend any time building this unless you've got free time. This is a culture which has grappled and finally grasped uh, some kind of control away from the earth and is now standing proud in itself and saying, hey, we exist as well. I would imagine that Tune Coit was used um, for all kinds of different rituals. Most of those are lost to us. I think that you can spend your life conjecturing. It's very easy to get new age about things like this. But uh, the most important thing is the fact that this thing still exists. There are so few of them, and we're here just to celebrate the fact that it's still here.
and walking into the middle of Moscow and Un stone circle. I think it's the greatest stone circle on the Land's End Peninsula. And I'm walking right up to the center. What makes it the greatest is its position almost at the Land's End and the fact that it has this huge monolith leaning at the very center. The stone circle was entirely enclosed by gorse until last summer solstice where it was all cleared back because so many people visit here on the summer solstice. But this is probably the most living site in the whole of Land's End, maybe one of the most living sites in the whole of Britain. I don't think any casual tourists come here. I just don't think they find it. It's just off the A30, but there's no sign. And as one crusty once said to me, people don't go anywhere nowadays unless there's a sign. Day two, the land's end. Feel good. It's 4 a.m. It's not real. Today we're going to go to Bole Fugu, also at the land's end. And then we're zooming off to, uh, we're going from the West Penwith Peninsula to Penrith Travel Lodge. So this is where they were excavating here? Yes. Bole Fugu is in Joe May's garden, and we're here to explore how, here at the Land's End, Neolithic ritual lingered into the later prehistoric times. You two, I can't believe it, and you white trainers. Yeah. <laughs> Fugu's. Fugu's an underground chamber which you find in Cornwall, which people who haven't traveled tend to confuse with souterrains, which are other underground chambers, which you find in Ireland, in Brittany, in Scotland. But Fugus have a seemingly different function. So this is Ian Cook, Hello. who's a Fugu obsessive and has written a fantastic book called Mother and Son. Yes, you and yeah. Are you suggesting this was some kind of religious shrine to the fruits of the earth? Yeah, I think that's a very fair remark. I would, yeah. I would certainly suggest that, yes. Yeah, I think I all like the evidence goes... Yeah, I do, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's got, it makes far more sense than ideas of um, refuge and storing um, yeah. bits of meat and whatever. Totally ludicrous. Yeah, so many people think that there's storage involved here, but, I mean, we're all up to our ankles in water. Mm. Uh, give us some examples of things that go on here now, Joe? Well, people use this for private meditation. Uh, we bring groups in here sometimes, depending mm. on the kind of workshop, uh, where we might do um, ceremonies of various kinds. But in a sense, the fugu is actually much longer than it appears in this reality, but that, that it's possible to journey in another reality mm. even further. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've indeed used it like that. And it does seem, this is like a, a gateway, it's a portal. This is just the airlock <laughs> before you go from yeah. this reality, woo. It's a, a powerful image, a, a big, mighty passage like this going into the earth that it's very easy to project our own interpretations onto that. So I'm coming at this from the perspective of being a psychologist and a psychotherapist, mm. running a center here where people come and do inner work, mm. and I can relate to this passage in, in those kinds Absolutely. of terms. Yeah. And other people coming from different perspectives would have their own, I think, perfectly mm. valid um, use and interpretation of what's going on here. I'm glad we got to do this because I, I was thinking that, um, that we wouldn't get to do a fugu. Yeah. And um, it's definitely worked out well. Oh, good. There's a head here. Shoulders. Can you see it, actually? Do you see it? Um, Do you I see it? think that I could see it, um, but... Am I just a nutter?
I was a typical rock and roller, a typical British rock and roller who didn't learn to drive till I was, what, 34. So I was driven around for years uh, by tour managers and uh, just lying legless in the back, not having a clue where I was. And I found now that if I'm not driving myself, I feel like I don't have any control over my life. I feel as though, at least if I'm driving, I know I'm going to get there. If I'm falling asleep at the wheel, I pull over and I have a sleep. But at least I'm in control. And I have to say that in terms of doing this field work, I'm anti-car, but we're stuck in this car culture. After about six or seven years of traveling, I started realizing that I was staying more and more in travel lodges. And people were asking me why. Why are you staying in travel lodges all the time? They're totally characterless. They're totally anonymous. They're always the same. And I said, precisely. I said, I'm just getting fed up with traveling for seven hours, being exhausted after a full day's, of, uh, full day's field work, and then having to listen to, you know, some sweet biddy who says, uh, oh, you know, this is the porch that we built two years ago, and, and I just feel like, give me the keys, bitch. Anonymity is everything. It's the only way to achieve what, what I'm trying to achieve, I think. Is giving me the keys bitch too compassionless? I don't know, it's probably more rock, isn't it? River Emont. Okay, we're now just east of Penrith. Uh, yesterday we drove from the West Penrith Peninsula, which is Land's End, stayed in the travel lodge, chilled out, and now we're traveling east of Penrith. So we're way up in Cumbria. We're off to Long Meg and her daughters, which I guess is what, the sixth biggest stone circle in Britain. It's a very, very powerful stone circle. And, uh, place of great mystery. We're now standing at uh, Long Meg and her daughters. It's a fantastic ring of 69 stones, many of them standing, many of them fallen from an attempt to destroy them about 150 years ago. Many of these Cumbrian circles are absolutely enormous. None of them come close to Long Meg, which is why we came to Long Meg. In the foreground is the outlying stone, which is Long Meg herself. Long Meg is a huge piece of sandstone carved on one side and dragged here from at least six miles away. I think the way that it sits in the landscape is definitely angled towards those hills. Archaeoastronomers' general conjecture is that it was sighted upon some kind of notch in the hills. I'm not really sure how I feel about that, but definitely the psychology of the monument is definitely facing these huge hills. I like the mythology of Long Meg. They say that the stones will bleed if Long Meg is ever dragged down. When they decided, the farmer decided maybe about 150 years ago that he was going to clear this field, he knocked down many of the stones and was about to pull them away and an enormous thunderclap, uh, followed by a huge rainstorm, freaked out all the workers so much that they just all ran for it. So, uh, well, it was providential, it's... Uh, it saved the circle, which is the most important thing. Whatever they believed, they believed enough to build this. So I think they must have believed something pretty far out, something powerful.
board the ferry from Ullapool to uh, Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis. And we're going to see Callanish, one of the greatest monuments of all. It stands on a promontory right up on the northwest coast. It's just fantastic. Because the pilgrimage is just so extreme, it totally changes the, uh, the whole feel of Callanish. If you had to travel miles and miles overland to get to Stonehenge and the A303 didn't pass so close to it, it would probably do the same thing. It's just... it's a trip. This is one of the most extreme places in Britain in terms of this landscape. It's definitely this, uh, it is like a, some kind of weird lunar landscape. We're going off to see Margaret and Ron Curtis, who are going to be telling us about Callanish and its uh, lunar orientations. So we're definitely in a the lunar mode. Up on the horizon there, can you see Callanish? Far out. This is uh, an ancient monument built 3,000 years before the Christian period, and yet its ground plan is the form of a Celtic cross. And we are actually at the stone. I think what you've got at Callanish is a love of ritual taken to an obsessive level. The most impressive thing is, is that you've got such a complete monument. From 1857 to the present day, that's when we see the stones as they are. For thousands of years before that, until about here, the stones were entirely covered in peat which preserved the stones because nobody thought that it was a very important monument. All this stuff which would have been destroyed in the most fundamental Christian times had a chance to live. Then, suddenly antiquarianism in the 1800s became very cool and very hip. And so the Lord, the Laird, said, Aha! We will now reveal the stones. And then, here was revealed one of the most fantastic monuments in the whole of the British Isles. To see this in its complete state is just wonderful. At last, with two dear friends that I've been talking about all the way, Margaret and Ron Curtis. They've become completely obsessed, and um, everything that they've discovered is uh, eye-opening and fantastic. Having come to Callanish, and it's like an empty crossword or something, mm. or a, an undone jigsaw, you just get in and do it. Ron and I met up at a very early stage, and he taught me how to do the surveying and horizon profiles. It was a very scientific thing, checking the astronomy. Once you put the lunar stuff in, it all fell into place. Say so these sites are lunar, lunar observatories, if you like. Mm. They were also a centre of focus for the community. These people had a lot more knowledge than we have nowadays about the natural movements of the sun and moon. The very layout of this main site is like a calculator or an almanac. You can go back and read what's happening. It would work today. You only need to be here a couple of months and you can tell exactly how far you are through the 18 and a half year cycle. At Callanish here, it's gone beyond sort of practical into a much more ceremonial thing. Each site is like a stage set. You view through it and the gaps between the stones form a frame. He's probably replicating 
a ceremonial that took place 5,000 years ago, once a month, for a few months every 18 and a half years. These times when the moon was on its very low track. And the audience, or congregation, whatever you want to call them, weren't in the circle, they were down at the far end of the avenue. So let's go and see what it was they were looking at. This funny spacing of stones is real. There aren't any stones missing here. The positioning of these and spacing is critical to keeping tabs on what the moon was up to and what it's going to do tomorrow night. Because if you've got this drama, you don't want it to go wrong. Whoever's in charge, a single person or a committee, has got to know what's going to happen tomorrow night. Ocalanish here, it's, it's primarily to do with the moon, but the moon related to those Mother Earth hills. Kayach na Montag. In Gaelic, it's the, the old woman of the moors, but in English, people refer to her as Sleeping Beauty. If they weren't there, Kalanish stones wouldn't be here. Now you see Sleeping Beauty again. And in fact, this stone is set a little bit skew to the others. And I don't know if it's possible to view along this. And so that it almost directs your eye to Sleeping Beauty. And can you try and imagine the moon appearing just about at her knees and rolling up to the right, skimming the leftmost stone and dropping into the hilltop. It's not the last sighting we get of the moon because you see the tallest stone of the all inside the circle and at the ground level beside that is the point where the moon is going to reappear in that spot where Julian's standing. He would be totally engulfed by the moon if he would just fit it neatly. The audience or congregation stand back, they view through the circle, and when the moon reappears, you can have someone standing inside it. Now, this isn't scientific, it's, it's drama, it's ritual, whether it's the new king, priestess, or it just gives authority to the person that's within the moon. The ancients were very theatrical. To a certain extent, they became what I would term even like the first glam rockers. Recently, it's been discovered that um, the ancients were wearing makeup, that the women were wearing glamorous outfits, that the guys were swanning around in good gear. You know, this idea that they were barbarians is fairly kind of misleading. They were taking control of their lives and as they were taking control of their lives they were feeling better about themselves you feel better about yourself your sense of your physical makes you stand more upright and that's what you become I think the sites have such a relationship with rock and roll because the sites were places where people came for their theatre, where they came to dance, where they came for their drama, to bring drama in and to make them feel taller, to make them feel better about themselves. They were agriculturists. They maybe sometimes their harvest had failed, but when they came to the site, you know, there would be uh, there would be a sense of hey, we've achieved this. We've achieved these the building of these huge stones. When we um, when we get beyond Inverness, it's the same as being in Lands End. It's what I term beyond Rome. So the whole psychology of the place changes because where the Romans didn't build their straight roads, you don't have linear thought. Thought starts to get a bit more serpentine. Everybody starts to wend their way everywhere. It's a bit like the, uh, the journey starts to become important again. People aren't just concerned with getting there. The journey is actually uh, an important part of it. When we get to mainland Orkney, about three miles from the ferry, we'll be picking up one of the greatest sacred landscapes left, built around five and a half thousand years ago. 
can't tell if we're going to get a smooth ferry crossing. Um, yeah, well, the ancients came over. They used to cross over 5,000 years ago, so if they could do it in eight-seater canoes, we can surely do it with the P and O. I have no desire to go back to the Neolithic. They only did it in eight-seater canoes because that's all they had. If the Neolithics had had electric guitar, they'd have been playing it. If Beethoven had an electric guitar, he'd have been playing it. If anybody who's a forward-thinking mofo has something brand new, they're using it. They were forward-thinking. Even if they were inching forward, they were forward-thinking. We're close now because we're in Thurso, we're, so we're, we're getting very close to the, um, the motel that I played. Every summer I took my family and then we just move around and play various gigs and um, the gigs would pay for my field work. This is the place, the new way in. I played here in 1993. Nobody wanted me to be playing, nobody thought it was entertaining apart from one Julian Cope fan. I was being supported by this uh, Australian guy called Gypsy Dave Smith, who's really, really heavy and a lovely guy, who's playing a 1935 Dobro. And he'd always be like, keep your pants away from me, Dobro. And I was standing there, I was going, what do you think, Dave? He went, you're in trouble. I said, what is it? And I held up two pairs of shorts that I was going to wear. I said, sooty shorts or Daffy Duck shorts? And I went on stage. Uh, the nine-minute vocal mantra, and um, nobody gave me any grief at all. We've left Scrabster, the uh, northernmost ferry terminal, crossing over to Orkney mainland. First thing we're going to see is we're going to see Hoy, this great island made of a big, dark, dark rock with a, a famous stack known as the Old Man of Hoy. When we come around Hoy, we'll find that the rest of the Orkney Islands are much, much lower. In fact, the whole orientation of Orkney is south because wherever you're standing on the Orkneys, you're looking, your eyes are transfixed by these two huge uprisings of dark rock always looking down at the mountains of Hoy. Hoy is what every Orcadian stares at all of their life. Look at the light on that! Okay, we're currently at Mays Howe in the north part of the uh, sacred landscape, looking down towards Hoy. From Mays Howe, we'll go down to see Broga, which is another enormous earth ring with standing stones around it, another very, very large circle called uh, the Stones of Stennis, but these monuments are all intervisible. Mays Howe is fantastic. It's the, the largest of these uh, chambered cairns always overwhelming to be here. There's nothing that surpasses Maze Howe. If you look at the construction of Maze Howe, there's nothing in the Neolithic world which tops it.
when his hair is incredibly spectacular. It's always breathtaking to be in here. To see the construction in here just shows where the, uh, the British culture achieved its pinnacle. Because the stones are so closely packed together. In 1861, James Farrer came through the roof and sort of brought Mays Howe back into history for the first time since the Vikings. Um, the Vikings had broken in, King Hakon broke in in the, uh, in the 12th century. He bought treasure away from this Howe, apparently, according to the graffiti, and uh, they sheltered him here for a night. And according to the uh, Orkney Inga saga, Two of his men went crazy. It's uh, stated very flatly, but you can only imagine what it would be like to have two crazy men on your team, slowing them down considerably, especially uh, a group of patriarchal warriors like the Vikings, who were full on at all times. It seems that the idea that all the community was buried in here is obviously an impossibility, because so many people were needed to construct this. Seems that there was a selected bunch of people. The winter solstice, at the sunset, just before sunset, the sun shines directly down this 35 foot passage, right into the main chamber. It's uh, something that's also seen in New Grange in uh, Ireland. And um, of course, it would have been always spectacular. Possibly, it would have been something that initiates were shown, you know? just to say, okay guys, we've got this control, you're part of this culture, let's take it forward. They would have seen everything as part of this great cosmic drama. We're now at the Standing Stones of Stennis. This is one of the most fantastic stones in uh, megalithic culture. It's over 20 feet high and probably four or five inches thick. Standing stones used to number 12. Now there are only three. But this would have once looked like a sort of a megalithic crown in the landscape. It's possible that rituals over the years went from one place to another in kind of a procession, maybe a progress across the landscape. Best one. I'm standing on a mound looking down to the ring of Broga. This is the most impressive of all the uh, circles in terms of its physical size. The ring of Broga is the latest of these monuments, still in existence, made after Stennis and after Mays Howe. When they dug this ditch, they had to go down directly into Orcadian flagstone, like the stones that the monument is made of. They had to dig with antler pickaxes, chip, chip, chip away until this stuff finally came up. It was an enormous job, so clearly the significance of the ditch was enormous. I think seeing a lot of these monuments, it's definitely likely that there were people employed, people employed to perceive monuments, perceive their place in the landscape, people who traveled vast distances to do just that. There are certain obsessions that the Neolithic architects seem to put in to certain little details, almost as though it was a, um, a megalithic thumbprint that said I was there. It's um, quite possible that there was a gang of uh, incredibly uh, versatile megalithic builders that moved around. I'm quite surprised that these monuments have stayed as well as they have. I think they must have chosen the stone incredibly well. There must have been somebody out there who was a, a right quarry expert. That was a very inspirational visit. I think that 
this visit is some of the best weather I've ever seen here. Yeah, just everything about Orkney is very impressive. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back. We're currently at Kirkton of Kulsalmond in Aberdeenshire. The main reason that we've come here is that sacred hill up on the horizon known as Dunedir. Dunedir is kind of like a lost Glastonbury of the north. On top of that sacred hill is a small, the remains of a 12th century chapel, very similar to Glastonbury Tor. This church was built on top of a stone circle. It seems to have survived until the 1700s, at which time the stone circle was dug up and cast into the floor of what is now the church of the Kirkton of Kulsamond, or Kulsamond. So if we stand there and we look across, we can see its prehistoric significance. And the reason we're here is to show right across the area at least 14 stone circles make that its main focal point okay and there in front of us is Denny Deer the uh, central sacred hill of this Aberdeenshire scenery the reason that this is such a strong image is because it can give us some idea of what Glastonbury would have once upon a time been like before Christianization destroyed many of the stone circles What's happened in Aberdeenshire is that there are just so many, it's impossible to destroy all the circles. I'm standing in the stone circle of East Aquithes. This is one of the greatest and one of the earliest stone circles in Aberdeenshire. In Aberdeenshire, we find a level of stone circle building that's quite out of proportion with the rest of the British Isles. They became totally obsessed with this weird phenomenon a large recumbent stone, almost like some huge megalithic sideboard right in the middle, and then the two huge upright flankers which dwarf the rest of the stones. The reason that we're here is because we're going to be exploring the fact that this, almost as a megalithic altar, appears in every stone circle that we're going to see. And we're talking about a level in Aberdeenshire which created over 160 stone circles just in this area. As we walk back from the flankers, the stones start to decrease in size. And at the opposite side, we have the stone where clearly the initiate or the younger members of the tribe were meant to view some kind of cosmic phenomenon. I think this is possibly the beginning of a separation with the Mother Earth. Once upon a time, it was enough to go to some great waterfall, some natural outcrop. But now, we stand proud. The beginning of us starting to stand, unfortunately, alone. Now we're coming round to the foot of Dunedir and we're going to be going past Stonehead. I think we've just got to do Stonehead because it's called Stonehead. 
Can you see right there? We're now at Dunny Deer Stone Circle. Dunny Deer spelt with an I, but Dunny Deer spelt with a Y. That's the way the British language has evolved. Everything is just so changeable. This is a smaller stone circle. The recumbent here and there is Dunny Deer. This is the closest to the sacred hill. As you can see, the recumbent is still upright. The main flanker is still upright. But this flanker has leant forward and erosion has caused it to split into two pieces. Most of the rest of the circle has been cleared and pushed around it. But still, with these rec recumbent stones and with the flankers next to it, we have enough evidence. And there's the obsession. Dunny dear. Aberdeenshire is my big thing because when we first came here I was mind blown as much as anything at what hadn't been done so I just started going and ringing on farmers doorbells and saying can I have a look at your stones zooming along doing it as fast as I could to get a kind of a grip on what was going on here and after about three years I started to realize that there was a kind of this focal point which is done a deer which is a psychological center even without stone circles. It's a focal point. You don't have to go, oh, well, there's an alignment. Yeah, it's a straight line. You know, it's a straight line. I can see this and it physically does something for me. So we'll make sure that the stone circle is within sight of that. They clearly meant it to play like a bit of a psychological game. And that's what the ancients were about, this constantly reinforcing the drama of where they were. Wanton Well Stone Circle, destroyed. They took a big tractor and they dragged all these stones all up against this recumbent. They knocked down the flanker, they smashed up the rest of the stones and they said, obliterated. Nobody can see this temple anymore, but they were wrong. Because the thing with this stone circle is, it's got a huge, huge recumbent. I want to stand here, I'm dwarfed. So even when they obliterated it, it still had done a deer in the background. So they were wrong again, because these are earth temples, and however much you do this in Aberdeenshire, there's always vestiges of the original temple, which makes them, in my book, pretty rock. I'm going to make sure I'm not being booked for failure to rock. So daily we're leaving uh, Aberdeenshire in pouring rain. The uh, River Don is all bloated and bursting its banks. We've had three days in Aberdeenshire and it's, it's blowing it down the whole time. Kind of like the first time I came back to Aberdeenshire, so it's, uh, it's okay. We'll come back. We're going down to Avebury, Marlborough Downs. At Avebury, everything is dotted around, but it's all basically aligned visually on Silbury. Silbury's the great hill, and Silbury's the great center. We're now approaching the uh, eastern edge of the Avery landscape, 2,500 miles later. This is the end of our journey. I'm standing on one of the great stones at Delling. 
This is where the ancients came thousands of years ago when they needed stone for building Avebury and maybe a thousand years later when they needed the stone for Stonehenge. This is the place where they came. But all this is a kind of natural quarry. A natural quarry in as much as these stones came down in a big slurry of glacial moraine at the end of the Ice Age. And this natural river, at one point, was probably a sacred area in itself. And what we have to see when we see Avebury is not some casual affair where they just decided Okay, now we've got to build a stone circle. Because Avery is the culmination of years and years of worship for thousands of years before those stone circles were ever built. Each stone had extreme significance. And here we are at the very, very first temple, the natural temple, Delling. As the ancients passed down this ridgeway, many of them would have been traveling from very, very far up north. And as they came down, they would have been preparing to arrive at the sanctuary about two miles south. It was from the sanctuary that all the eastern processions were made into Avebury. But as they came down, the ancients decided to enhance the progression down here. And so from Old Chapel, about two and a half miles away, walking down, they would have noticed a weird phenomenon. They would have noticed the top of Silbury Hill, the biggest human construction in the whole of Europe, passing along the top of Waden Hill. Now in the Neolithic time, Silbury would have been white. And so what they would have seen was the top 30 feet just shimmering and as they moved along, they would realize that they had no idea what they were seeing. The ancients are walking down, freaking out. It's a psychological plot to totally blow their minds. Only at this point does Silvery stop riding on the back of Waden Hill to be revealed as the largest, single largest mound that these people would ever have seen. At this point, the sacred landscape opens up to them. Silvery! Silvery, the center of the sacred landscape. Avery Stone Circle is the biggest stone circle in Europe, the biggest stone circle in the world. But Silbury is the center of everything. The omphalos, the navel. 5,000 years ago, Silbury was white, entirely made of chalk. They kept it white to keep it prominent in the landscape. And yet, they built it on a valley floor. Because this is from a time when people didn't try to make these big, priapic, phallic monuments. They weren't trying to make it just purely impressive. To a certain extent, Silbury is hidden. And yet, when you travel around this huge landscape, you see it from everywhere. Silbury was the world hill, I think. Some people say it was the eye, the all-seeing eye, which you can see as you travel across the landscape, but can see you. Walking down from the sanctuary, we come to the West Kennet Avenue. The West Kennet Avenue led us right down into the great circle at Avebury. When we're looking at a monument the size of Avebury, we're talking about throngs, crowds of people, people who've come for miles and miles. It's also likely that people stood on either side of the ancient avenue and watched significant characters themselves walking down.
So here we are in the Great Avebury Henge, the biggest stone circle in the world, a gigantic amphitheatre. We've come down from the Ridgeway. The ancients would have been travelling for days. They would have collected at the sanctuary. We've come down the West Kennet Avenue and we finally burst into this huge, huge earth circle. And though Silbury is the centre, Avery is the place where they would have gathered. Thousands of people thronging this centre. If we think of Mecca and what Mecca means to Islam, then people travel for many days to Mecca. They make a perambulation, then they travel down into the Kaaba, and then they get right down into the centre, and in the centre is the Great Stone. This is very much the same thing. There's a quote in the Old Testament that says, If thou makest me a temple, make it of unhewn stone, for if thou raise thy tool against it, thou hast polluted it. It seems to me that Avebury is an example of that period of natural temple. We're at West Kennet Longbarrow, looking north to Silbury. Silbury is the hub of this great Neolithic wheel. The landscape is constantly disorientating us as we travel around, but wherever we are, we keep going back to Silbury as the centre. Silbury. I'm walking towards Silbury, the largest Neolithic mound in the whole of Europe. And I'm walking in a straight line down a Roman road which 2,000 years ago was directed straight at this enormous Neolithic mound. Because this Roman road is a military police road. And the mere fact that the Roman engineers considered it important to align their military road with Silbury shows that even 3,000 years after it was built, Silbury had an enormous power to be exerted on the people and the landscape around here. We can go all over Britain and we can investigate the Roman roads and we can use the Roman paranoia to divine the Celtic and pre-Celtic sacred landscapes. Silbury. Standing at the Mother's Jam, a sacred quarry at the heart of the Marlborough Downs. For thousands of years, humanity felt no need to build their own temples. Instead, they'd come to great sacred outpourings of the Mother Earth. Huge waterfalls, significant yew trees, and then natural stone temples. And here at the Mother's Jam, I once picked 27 different types of mushrooms in under an hour. That's how fabulous this place is. But of course, as humanity changed, it was to these significant stones that they came when they needed material for their first temples. And so, it was three miles that they dragged stones from the Mother's Jam all the way over to the west to create the stone circle of Avebury. But of course, nobody moves 38 ton stones without a considerable amount of thought. They would have examined each stone. They would have mused upon it with friends. They would have said, I think we should take this stone. I mean, I remember my great-grandfather having a great dream here. I remember him saying to my grandmother, that's a dreaming stone. Mm, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying, but somehow this stone wouldn't look good in a circle. Would it look good upright? Yeah, but are we actually putting it up to look good, or are we putting it up because of the significance of it? Well, I don't know, I don't know. But the thing is, just on a practical level, how are we going to move it? And these conversations would carry on. Well, they would have to be pragmatic. They would have to make sense. We'll pick this stone because it looks good, It'll make sense standing upright, and it has significance. 
and bit by bit, the Temple of Avery was built. Whenever I come to the Polisher Stone, I'm immediately transported back to the time when people didn't even need to build monuments. But this stone was used for over 1,200 years. And when we think of 1,200 years, and we think of the amount of generations involved in working this stone into a concave bowl with deep ruts on its right-hand side, 1,200 long years starts to make sense when we think of it as being longer than the present day, backdated to before the Normans, to before Doomsday. People were up here, polishing their stone axe heads, engaging in conversation, looking down on the same landscape that they'd been visiting for thousands of years. And a polishing stone would be used for everyday items, for polishing working axes. All the flint on these downs needed to be constantly resharpened for reuse. The Neolithic was especially a time of ceremonial objects. Rough versions of this ceremonial axe head would have arrived here, would be gradually worked and worked and worked, and then into the grooves, going down deep, endlessly back and forth, into this phenomenal a significant ritual object was created, something which the Neolithics managed to become absolutely obsessed with. For in that way, they were no different from us. Everything I've done for the last decade has been based on centering myself in this landscape, allowing myself to walk around this place, to slow myself down to this pace. You've just got to look beyond your own culture. That's the way you can read between the lines and see. I think that is uh, my job.